Thanks, Dave. Morning, everybody. Yeah, as Dave mentioned, I've been battling a bit of a cold this week, and uh, the battle still isn't over. So uh, it's going to be a shorter message this morning. Um, <coughs> it's going to be no more than sort of 15, 20 minutes, because I don't know if my voice will give us much more than that. So if I go a bit croaky at the end, uh, I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll forgive me. Um, I'm continuing on our series today that we've been looking at, uh, looking at Isaiah 9, verse 6, in the run-up to Christmas. And I'm going to just read that verse again to us, just to uh, remind us of it. And it says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Those of you who were here will remember a couple of weeks ago, I looked at um, this idea, this uh, name, Wonderful Counselor. Last week, Pastor Dave looked at Mighty God, and next week at the carol service, he'll look at Prince of Peace. So today, we're thinking around this uh, topic of he will be called Everlasting Father. And when we say the word Father, I think immediately... Each of us pictures something in our mind. Each of us has our own understanding, perhaps, when we hear this word father. And it might conjure up some really positive memories. It might conjure some really positive thoughts. But for some, it's maybe a really um, negative word. For some, it's a word that may be filled with pain, that's maybe filled with sorrow. And uh, and maybe we need to uh, begin by addressing that by addressing the elephant in the room for some people. I remember <coughs> talking to someone who um, she was well in, you know, she was in her 70s. She'd been a, a Christian for many, many years. And we were talking testimonies one day and she was sharing with the story of how she came to faith. And um, in her childhood, her, her father had, um, had abandoned her, had walked out and, and her mother had been abusive through her entire childhood and she said to me that when she came to faith she had no problem with accepting Jesus's death on the cross she had no problem with accepting his resurrection and all of that but she said the biggest thing for her was getting to a point of accepting God as her everlasting heavenly father because of what her experience of a father was and I know that she's she's not alone in that I know other people who have had really poor examples in humans, the human sense of fatherhood. But I want to say that whatever our earthly experience of, of a father is, whether good or bad, God is so much greater, so much more than that. And so if you're this, here this morning and your experience of, of a humanly father is, is poor and substandard, Firstly, I'm very sorry that that's the case, but I want to say to you that is not the kind of father that we're talking about this morning. When we call Jesus our everlasting father, we're talking about something greater than any of us have ever experienced. You know, even if we didn't have an earthly father who treated us well, I think we all have this intrinsic understanding within us of what a good father should be. We all have an idea of what a good father should look like. And I believe that that comes from the way we've been created. I believe that that comes from God planting that understanding within our hearts when he designed us, when he formed us. Each of us, we all have a need to be loved, to be cherished, to be protected, to be cared for, to be valued. And each of us understands that a father should do those things. And I believe that that understanding comes from our everlasting father who knit us together in our mother's wombs. In Psalm 68, God is called the father to the fatherless. The orphaned, hallelujah, have a family. He's described as a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. Goes along those lines is what I said. If you've had a poor 
example of a father here on earth or a poor example of family here on earth. God is a father to the fatherless. He provides the orphan with a family. When we think of God and we think of Jesus, we've, I think, got to first look at the Trinity. We know the Trinity. We have God in three forms, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All of them equal parts, none greater than the other. And so when we think of Father um, and talk about it in that sense, I think we all in our minds go to God the Father, Old Testament God before Jesus came. But we know that Jesus is God in human form and is an equal part, which is why Jesus, even though he is the son, is still a father to us. Jesus is God. Now, with regards to the Trinity, will we ever fully understand it in our limited human minds? I don't think we will. Many have tried. I don't think we've really fully ever got close. But Jesus being God and being equal is entitled to be our everlasting father. You know, if we think about some of the qualities that we would expect from a father, Jesus tells a parable in John 10 um, where he talks about, uh, he calls himself the good shepherd. Let me read a few verses to you. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Isn't that somewhat the same as being a father? A father looks out for his children. A father protects his children. A father makes sacrifices for his children. Uh, a father is willing to do whatever it takes for his children. And so when Jesus talks about being the good shepherd, in that we're seeing those characteristics of what a good father looks like. Of course, we've also got this word everlasting to think about and to think about what that means. And I think for most of us, when we hear the word everlasting, we, we simply think of something as having no end point, something that will go on and on and on forever. Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't say the same yesterday, today, and for another month or another year, but forever and ever and ever. Again, will we ever fully understand that in our human, uh, limited human understanding? I don't think so. You know, I take tremendous comfort in knowing that the same God who in Genesis said, let there be light and light was, is the same God who heard the cries of the people in Egypt and sent Moses to lead them out of there, is the same God that David wrote so many wonderful Psalms about, is the same God that loved the world so much that sent Jesus. The same Jesus that we talk about is the same uh, the Jesus that healed so many, that cared for the downtrodden, that brought the social outcasts, that cared for the weirdos that nobody else cared for. The same God is the, the God whose Holy Spirit's power did tremendous things with the evolution of the church in the New Testament. All of that is the same God that we've been singing about this morning. And is the same God that we'll be singing about in 20, 30, 40 years if God gives us the breath to do so. And he's the same God that we'll be singing about for eternity. Because he's the same yesterday, today and forever. He doesn't change. Revelation 1 verse 8 describes him as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. James 1.17 says that every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. We live in a world where everything changes. We live in a world where, you know, even on a weekly or a monthly basis, we're constantly, aren't we? We're having to deal with change. But we have an ever constant in our lives who remains the same, who never changes, whether we're having a good day or a bad day. 
whether we're on the mountain peaks or in the valleys, God is still good. God is still our everlasting father. He is pre-existent before the mountains were born. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You know, we know in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but before that, God already was. (laughs) One of the main obstacles I find when I talk to people who aren't believers If we get on to the subject of creation, one of their biggest obstacles is, well, who created God? Anybody else been asked that question? Yeah. Who created God? Why? Because from our human understanding, we can't understand that God already was. But I want to say to you, he is pre-existent. He's also self-existent. In Exodus 3... There's this back and forth between God and Moses and God calls himself, I am. And this name really defines the God who is. He's totally independent of his creation. He's totally outside of time. He is the God who is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end and everything in between. He's the God of the uh, eternal present tense. And because he's self-existent, God is completely self-dependent, completely self-reliant. John Bevere, in one of his, his books, he writes, he's talking about this topic of eternity. And he writes this. It's quite a long quote, but I think it's, I think it's a really good one. Eternity is not just a matter of ceaseless time because it is not subject to time. Eternity actually transcends time. To speak of eternity in terms of merely perpetual duration is to miss out on the full picture. To capture the best view of eternity, we must look at God himself, for he is not limited in power, knowledge, wisdom, or understanding. He is self-existent, forever was and forever will be God. He is called the everlasting father, Isaiah 9, 6, that we've been looking at, and called the king of eternity. 1 Timothy 1.17. All that is eternal is found in him. In fact, eternity itself, it's found in him. All that is outside of him is temporal and will change. No matter how good, noble, powerful, or enduring it may seem, it will eventually cease. Even the earth and the universe will change, but he will not. That's the God that we read about throughout scripture. That's the God that we've been singing about this morning. That's the God that we serve. In John 8, verses 12 to 58, there's this uh, back and forth, this dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees. And they're um, having this debate. And the Pharisees, um, Jesus called God his father and the Pharisees called Abraham their father. And Jesus says to them, well, if Abraham were their father, they would do the works of Abraham. So they respond by um, matching Jesus' claim to say, well, that they have one father, and that is God himself. This is what Jesus replies to them. If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. Jesus recognizes God as his everlasting father. Isn't it great that Jesus and we have something in common? The Pharisees were making their claim to Abraham and to the God of Abraham. And Jesus clarifies to them that their link to Abraham was merely physical. Their link to Abraham was uh, purely through human uh, ancestry. And then he makes this most amazing statement of all. In verse 58 of John 8, he says, Before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And you see, in the mind of the Pharisees, They knew what Jesus was doing. He was very clearly referencing back to Exodus 3. 
to that back and forth between Moses and God before Abraham was. In the very beginning, I already was. The Pharisees knew their Old Testament. Of course they did. They, knew, you know, they had to know it in order to exploit it to better themselves. They knew their Old Testament. So they knew, they knew what Jesus was saying and it struck a nerve. And for them, for them, it's a, great, it's a, a, a very interesting uh, passage to read. Um, but they recognize and think Jesus has gone too far because what he's doing is he's making a claim that's making him equal to God himself. The I am of the burning bush in Exodus 3. And this claim really infuriated them and they, uh, they ended up picking up stones and actually tried to kill him. Such was, their, such was their anger. There are two things for us that I think we can take away. Two things for us, really, I, I think, if we think of he should be called everlasting father that are applicable to us in our daily lives. The first one is this. What does a father do? I think ultimately a father provides. A father cares for, a father looks out for his children. You know, one of my f- favorite songs to sing when, when I'm in a time of need or through a storm is, um, I don't know if you know it, the old Don Moon song, God will make the way where there seems to be no way. You know, isn't that what a father does? You know, those of you in the room who are fathers, I'm sure you've all got stories of times your children have called on you to, you know, to fix a problem, to find a solution, you know, to, to help, help them out of a mess. That's what a father does. That's the kind of father we have. He makes a way, even though we can't see the solution. He fixes the problems we don't know how to fix. He provides in ways greater than we can even comprehend. So each of us, regardless of our human experience of family, regardless of our human experience of fatherhood, each of us share this Amazing, everlasting Father. And the second takeaway is that we are a family. Someone, I can't remember who, in one of their prayers, referred to us as brothers and sisters. And that is what we are. Through Jesus Christ, through, through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, we have been brought into a family. The orphan has a family through Jesus and that has some implications for us. You know, as a, as a church, as a, a group of people, whatever you want to call it, ultimately we are a family. And so we must think about, well, what does a family do? Well, a family looks out for each other. Family cares for each other. Family wants what's best for each other. It doesn't get jealous. It doesn't get competitive. It doesn't run each other down. But it looks out for each other. It meets practical needs where it can. Look around. We are a family. And it's through our everlasting Father. That's what binds us together. I'm going to pray for us in a moment as we wrap up. But my hope and my prayer is that each of us would leave today with a real understanding and a real sense of belonging. That we belong to God, we belong to Jesus, our everlasting Father who will never end. But also we belong to a family. Not just a family here at CCC, we belong to a family globally. Isn't it amazing to think that we have brothers and sisters right around the world at this very moment who are doing what we're doing, who are meeting to praise and worship in every country of the world, Some doing it in secret, some doing it open like this. But we are part of an incredible family. And it's all because of Jesus. Let me pray for us. Lord, we want to, first of all, thank you for the gift of your son. We want to thank you that as we come up to this period of Christmas and remember and reflect that it is all about Jesus. He really is the the reason for this entire season. And we thank you, Lord, that you sent him to this earth to 
die on that cross for us as we've been remembering at communion. And we thank you for what that means for us. Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you that you are our everlasting Father. You are the one who meets our needs. You're the one who provides for us, who protects us, who looks out for us. And I pray for each one of us this morning that we would leave with a a, a fresh understanding of that, Lord. Lord, with a fresh reminder of that in our lives. I pray too, Father, that you would uh, help us to see that we are part of a family. Lord, I thank you that you take the orphan and you give them a greater and larger family than they could ever imagine. And I pray, Father, that you would help us here at CCC to always act as a family. Lord, to always love one another, to care for one another, to provide for one another, to look out for one another, to try and see the best in one another. Lord, I pray, Lord, again, as we leave uh, today, that you would help us feel connected, help us feel part of your family. We ask these things in your wonderful name. Amen.